Before I give my message, there's a couple things I need to tell you about. One is that last week, <clears throat> I have a confession to make. Last week, I gave some erroneous information in my sermon. I take very seriously the fact that uh, I am preaching God's Word. I can explain it, but it doesn't excuse it. As if you were here last week, you remember I said that I changed my sermon topic at the, on Friday. And we were talking about the two miracles of the miraculous catch of fish from John 21 and Luke 5. And as I had three separate windows on my screen, uh, as I was looking at part of it, I saw two of them. One said that Jesus called out, children, do you have any fish? And the other uh, window it said, friend, do you have any fish? And I assumed it was children the first time and friend the second. It wasn't. That was both the second time. And it was just difference in translation. The English Standard Version was correct. It's children. So even though I use that, it didn't change my main message. But I don't want anybody thinking that I don't take seriously being as accurate as I possibly can when I deal with God's Word, okay? The second thing is, for today's sermon, be prepared because you're going to be involved. And I hope you'll be involved in a very helpful way. So, I just want to say grace and peace to you from the God, God our Father, the Father of all mercies, who loved us and gave himself, Jesus gave himself for us. At this time, we're going to have our scripture reading, which you will be involved in, and I'm going to ask you to stand, because uh, you'll be sitting for a while, and we're going to go a little overtime, not sudden death, it's overtime, Okay. But we're going to read the scripture together as a responsive reading. So if Tanya and Lynette will come up. Pastor Lynette, come, come on up. So those who are sitting to my left, actually we'll do um, those here. Everyone, I'm going to stand a little bit more here. Everyone to my left, you will read uh, with me when you see uh, south side of sanctuary. Um, and we can start off. Uh, together. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. Now the north side of the sanctuary, from here to my right. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And everyone together. You, you are, are forgiving and good, O Lord, Lord abounding, abounding in love to, to all who call, call to you. you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you. They will bring glory to your name. For you, For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. Arrogant are attacking me, O oh God. A band of ruthless men seek my life, men without regard for you. But you, you O oh Lord, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding, abounding in, in love and faithfulness. faithfulness. You may be seated.
Hi, my name is Gary and I am a Pharisee. That may surprise some of you for a pastor to admit that. And you may think I'm disingenuous. I am not. Let me explain. And by the way, I, some of you probably recognize where I took that from, right? That's the way someone at Alcoholics Anonymous would introduce themselves if they were to be sharing what they were going through at that present time. If it was a newcomer, they might even be coming in drunk. <clears throat> if it was somebody who maybe had slipped and, and, and had a setback and drunk that week, it may be them. Or it could be somebody who'd been an alcoholic and had not had a single drink for 50 years. Now, I know there's controversy about saying they're still alcoholics, but many of them still do that. And see, many see value in that. Let's keep that in mind as we go forward. Let me tell you, that I have not been saying I am a Pharisee for very long. My journey towards admitting that I am a Pharisee began in late January, early February. I'd been studying the Psalms and meditating on the Psalms since mid-December. I'd been looking at a commentary that was very helpful. And I came to Psalm 86, the one you just read. And as I read through Psalm 86, I began to pick up the theme of this psalm. And then I read the commentary on the psalm. And I decided I was going to study mercy in depth, so I, I plugged into my computer Bible the word mercy and discovered that over 200 times in the Bible, Old Testament knew the word mercy is mentioned. And just recently, I went back and I plugged in the word mercies and merciful, and there are over 600 times it's mentioned in 184 verses. Now, don't misunderstand this statement, but there are doctrines that we and other Christians teach that have a far fewer verses than 100, 100, uh, 600 and 184 verses they're found in. That should tell us something about how important this topic should be to us. But as I went through this, I, I began to see that uh, I began to see that I really hadn't spent much time thinking about God's mercy. And when I was going through those texts the first time, I came across Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. You remember that? parable of Jesus when he was giving a parable and he said that uh, two men went into the temple to pray, a Pharisee and the other a tax collector or a publican. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It was at that point I had to bow my head and say, God, I have been a Pharisee for too long. I am still a Pharisee. I thought about my prayers and how often I talked to God and whether or not I had ever mentioned, whether or not I ever mentioned mercy, my need of mercy, or thanked him for mercy. You see, I think we get caught up in, in the idea, the meaning of a Pharisee as someone who's very legalistic and rigid and, and bound by rules. But in reality, a Pharisee is anyone who takes pride in what they know that others don't know. A Pharisee is anyone who who focuses on what they do that maybe others don't do or what they don't do that others do. To try and, and put it in another way, you can be a Pharisee as a traditional Seventh-day Adventist Christian or you can be a Pharisee as a progressive Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Because if your focus is on what you do or don't do and you think you're better than someone else because of it, you suffer from Phariseeism. And you don't have to be a Pharisee all the time because, I don't know about you, 
But I find that coming up within me from time to time, even though I don't like it very much. You can be a Pharisee if you focus on law or if you focus on grace. There's something else about Alcoholics Anonymous I want you to, to notice. After a person stands up and says, Hi, I'm Joe, and I'm an alcoholic, the people who are there respond and say, Hi, Joe. It's a way of affirming them and letting them know they're accepted. So I'm going to start all over again. Hi, my name's Gary, and I'm an alcoholic. Or not an alcoholic, I changed that. I got caught up in it. I'm not an alcoholic, okay? Hi, my name's Gary, and I'm a Pharisee. Thank you. Okay, now you get to participate again. You're going to say your name, and I'm going to respond, Laguna Church. You're going to say hi and say your name and that you're a Pharisee, okay? All right, one, two, three. Hi, Laguna Church. That wasn't so bad, was it? Let me tell you, as part of what I went through, I really had to ask myself, how often do I ask God, as I've already said, for mercy or thank Him for it? And on a scale of from never to now and then to often, oops, go back one, to frequently, went back to there, thank you, to regularly, I had to admit it was somewhere between never and now and then. I want you to think about how often you ask for God's mercy or how often you thank God for his mercy. After I discovered this, there was a Sabbath school class I belonged to in the Escondido Church, and I asked the teachers who organized it if I could have a Sabbath, and they gave it to me in March. And I had three people leading out, and I told them to read Psalm 86. When they got there, we divided them up. I didn't tell them what it was. I asked them what the theme of the, of the passage was. And they have a practice where they pray for people beforehand. And when they were praying, I was listening. Would anyone use the word mercy? And no one did. They described mercy when they prayed, but they never said the word. I also discovered that they did not, not one of the three groups, with about ten persons in each group, not one saw mercy as a theme of the passage. And finally, as they talked and shared, I discovered that they had a hard time distinguishing mercy from grace. And I want to help us distinguish between mercy and grace this morning. So I want to begin with the biblical definition. My remote is not working, so go ahead, Sabrina, take over. The biblical definition of mercy. Mercy is an action, this is from both Old and New Testament, mercy is an action taken by the strong towards the weak. The rich towards the poor, the insider towards the outsider, and those who have towards those who have not. And I would add, it's also about those who offend against the offender, right? I want you to notice, it says, mercy assumes a need on the part of the person who receives it, and resources adequate to meet the need on the part of the one who shows it. I would remind you of the parable of the prodigal son, which I refer to as parable of the prodigal father. And prodigal we think of as being sinful, but prodigal really means wasteful. And the father wasted his inheritance on the son, right? On both sons, actually. But this is a, a statue that's in front of La Sierra University. And it, I'm sorry, that's a good Samaritan. Prodigal son's coming up. I got confused. But the parable of the, of the good Samaritan. And you remember the parable of the good Samaritan only the Samaritan was willing to be merciful to the man who'd been beaten and robbed on the side. Only, only the Samaritan was willing to help out. The others thought they were too good to help out. And I would remind you that mercy is something that is given to those who are in need of it by somebody who has resources to help. And then I have a quote I want you to read to you from the commentary I referred to by James Montgomery Boyce. He says, nothing is more important to sinful men and women than finding mercy with God. 
Yet we do not appeal to mercy naturally and show it to others often. The mercy of God is such a tremendous and all-embracing theme that it applies to virtually every area of life. Every area of life. And that is true. And I'm going to not even suggest, I think it is true from what I've observed with myself and with others, that maybe the reason we have so much trouble being merciful to others is because we don't acknowledge and recognize the mercy we have received from God. We don't thank Him for it very often, and we don't pray about it very often. It's interesting what we call liturgical churches that have a set format and they read prayers and sometimes we, we almost look down on them because they read prayers instead of saying them. There are some wonderful prayers that you can find that are read in liturgical churches. And they often mention mercy. That doesn't mean the people get it, but they often mention mercy. The Psalms filled with requests for mercy. And so, if mercy affects virtually every area of our life, Shouldn't we focus on it a little more? I know in my journey since I read Psalm 86, I have. And it has impacted my walk with God. That's a testimony. I, I want to help you distinguish between mercy and grace. Because mercy and grace, we often think of them as being synonymous, and they're not. Mercy is you are not treated as you deserve to be treated. We are all sinners, and the wages of sin is what? We haven't received that punishment yet, have we? Grace is being given what we cannot earn or which, that which we cannot be equipped to give. In the discussion in that Sabbath school class, most people equated mercy and grace with just one thing, forgiveness. Forgiveness. And mercy is beyond, in fact, mercy doesn't include forgiveness. Mercy prepares for forgiveness. Because remember, it's given by one, the stronger to the weaker. To one who has, to, to those who ha don't have. Mercy prepares the way for forgiveness, but grace is more than just forgiveness. Grace is the fact that we are saved by grace, we live by grace and are transformed by grace. We serve by grace. And as leaders, we lead by grace. It is God's power at work within us to do that which we couldn't do for ourselves. It is more than just forgiveness of sin. And so I've got this little diagram on the screen. It, it used to spin, but when we transformed it into the pro presenter, it quit spinning. So you can imagine it spins, okay? Okay. And I wish I could have the, the different gears in different dimensions, okay? If I could have the way I'd like to do it, I would have gear A, which represents God's mercy, and gear B, which represents God's grace, be the same size. And so when God gives us mercy, His mercy is that He's not treating us as we deserve to be treated. And when those gears of God's mercy mesh with the gears of God's grace, that's where forgiveness takes place. Mercy brings us to the point of recognizing and acknowledging our need of forgiveness or our need to give forgiveness. But then when, when mercy and grace come together and God transforms us through that grace, it then impacts uh, our lives and we have transformed lives, which is gear C, which allows us to be merciful. And then as our lives are transformed, it in reacts with gear D, which expresses mercy and grace to others. So I want to go back to the statement I made earlier. Can you see why from this diagram, if we are not focused on the mercy of God on the far left, we will have a hard time expressing the mercy of God to others. I think that's true. Now some will say to me, and have said, since I did this, but Pastor Gary, what about people being accountable? We have mercy and forgiveness. People need to be... Mercy demands accountability through asking for forgiveness. Mercy demands accountability in a transformed life. 
And only God can be the impetus for those two things. Only God through his spirit. As I studied those 200 verses to begin with, I discovered that that there are five ways that show us what mercy is all about. Five ways that we see mercy in action. And the first one is that mercy is an attribute of God's character. In Exodus chapters 33 and 34, God says to Moses, Moses says to God, God, show me your glory. And God hides him in the cleft. He says, if you saw my glory, you die. And God's glory, glory is often referred to as, as his character. And in Exodus 33 and 34, the first description of God's character is not that he is just. The first description of God's character is not that he is righteous. The first description of God's character is not that he is holy. The first description of God's character in Exodus 33 and 34 is, guess what? Mercy. He's merciful. The first description of his character is merciful. In fact, if you look at, if you happen to have your Bibles open, but if you look at verse 5 of chapter 86, you discover that it says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. That's referring back to Exodus 33 and 34. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Verse 15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says that God is the Father of all mercies. We are the recipients of God's mercy every single day. Which brings us to the second way we see God's mercy God gives common mercies. What, what do I mean by that? Well, verse 8 says it. There are, are none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. Well, wait a minute. Those gods don't exist, so of course there's none like him. About. Remember, people who worshipped other gods expected those gods to provide for them their food, the rain to, to grow the food, the, the protection, everything that God himself does. God gives common mercy to all mankind. In fact, in Matthew 5, 45, Jesus said that the sun rises on the evil and on the good. That the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And when the rain falls on this earth, it helps produce crops so that everyone can have food. And if you see the picture on the right on the screen... Not only is it about getting food, but at the family table, and the reason I put that there is that everyone experiences love in this life, whether they are loving or not. Do you understand the point? Everyone on this earth, whether they realize it or not, are the recipients of God's mercy. But God's mercy is revealed in another way. God gives saving mercy. I want you to notice how this psalm starts. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. And then he goes on to say, but I am godly. How do you put those two together? You have to understand God's saving mercy and grace to do that. Remember what Jesus started out the Beatitudes with. Blessed are the what? Poor in spirit. Those who recognize their need of a God who saves. In fact, please notice verse 4. In the day of my trouble, I'm sorry, is it verse 4? Yeah. Please notice verse, um, verse 3, I'm sorry. Gladden the soul of your servant, for you, to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. I need salvation. Or verse 13, great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol, from the grave. God gives saving mercy. The prodigal son. I love this sculpture because it shows the father running towards the son who is in pig's smelling clothing. Perhaps pig gunk on his clothes. And the father takes his robe off and he puts it around his son. Now there's something interesting about this, and I talk about this for a long time, 
But for a father in that society to run towards anyone, to run, it would be shameful. When the father is running towards the son, he is taking the focus off the son's shame and putting it on himself. Do you catch the meaning of that? That's what God does for us. In his saving mercy, he takes our shame for our sin and he placed it on Jesus on the cross. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. We have saving mercy. Okay. I meant to do this and I forgot the first two. We're going to do it on this one. If you agree that you have received mercy from God, say thank you for your mercy. If you believe you've received common mercy, say thank you for the mercies of life. If you believe that you've received saving mercy, say praise God for his saving mercy. One more kind of mercy. There's two more, actually. The next one is... God gives mercy in times of difficulty. Verse 7. In the day of my trouble I will call upon you, for you answer me. Verse 14. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life, and they do not set you before them. Sometimes the troubles of life are just the circumstances of life that come our way. Sickness. Losing our jobs. Ill health. Sometimes it's the result of of how other people treat us. And sometimes it's because we make stupid and dumb mistakes. I said we. We all do, don't we? But I want you to notice, God gives mercy in times of difficulty. Notice the picture. Remember blind Bartimaeus, the story of blind Bartimaeus? Jesus is passing by and he calls out, Jesus, have mercy on me. It's interesting that the people who called for mercy were the ones who were in dire straits most of the time when they called on Jesus for mercy. If you think about what the psalmist talks about, if you think about the fact that God doesn't need to intervene in our lives. Sometimes we ask him to to intervene and he does, and sometimes he does it immediately, and sometimes he does it later, and sometimes it seems he doesn't do it at all. Or am I the only one who's had that experience? I don't know about you, but this whole thing about answered prayer is baffling to me. I will never forget a lady in Escondido years ago, told a story. It was Christmas time, and it was, we had a bunch of rain. It was years ago. And she had the children's story, and she told how she prayed for a good parking spot. And, and she found a parking spot right up by the store, and God gave her that parking spot. I'm not going to argue and debate it with her, but she believed that, and that's fine. Two people walked out of the church at that moment. Their daughter was dying of cancer, and God had not answered their prayer. I can't figure those two things out, can you? But the promise is he will be with us whatever we face, that he will give the mercy we need for whatever he chooses to give us or to allow to happen to us. God is merciful in times of difficulty. If you agree that God gives mercy in times of difficulty, would you say, thank you for your merciful blessings? And the last way he shows mercy is that God requires us to express it to others. I want you to notice verse 9. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things. How would the nations know that God was great and do wondrous things 
if God's people hadn't shared it with them. Right? How would they know that God had done great and wondrous things and merciful things if they hadn't seen God's mercy through his people? I want you to notice also verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my, ha- my heart to reverence your name or your character. Teach me your ways. The, one of the number one ways of God is that he performs and shows mercy to those who do not deserve it. He performs mercy in times of distress. He performs mercy to those who don't even acknowledge him. He, perform, he gives mercy to those who sin. He gives mercy when we have no claim to it at all. Remember the beatitude of Jesus? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? What? Mercy. You can say it. I really believe that as Christians, we have all too often either ignored God's mercy or forgotten His mercy or taken His mercy for granted. I, I think we think about mercy at the beginning of the Christian life when, when we were in sin and we didn't have God in our lives and we needed mercy then, but, but now that we've grown in our Christian walk, well, mercy is something that maybe we can just not think about much. I am convinced that the fact that we don't talk about mercy much or pray and ask God for mercy, that we have a harder time being merciful to others. Does that make sense at all? So, I'm going to ask you to stand and give your testimony. I don't normally tell people what their testimony is to be, but I'm going to do that this morning. Please stand. And where the blank is on the screen, I want you to say your name. But only if you mean this, okay? And here's what you're going to say. I'll say it with myself first. Hi, I'm Gary. I acknowledge God's many and varied mercies to me. I am willing by God's grace to be merciful to others. Can you say that with me? Hi. I'm I acknowledge God's many and varied mercies to me. I am willing by God's grace to be merciful to others. May God bless you as you seek to be more aware and acknowledge and express his mercy in your lives. Let's pray. Father of all grace and mercy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you are a merciful God. That we have received fresh mercies every single morning of our lives. Forgive us for taking your mercy for granted. Forgive us when we've forgotten the mercies we have received and complain about current situations. Forgive us when we have ignored your mercy and tried to live on our own accord as we leave this place. May we all be reminded that it's so easy to be, to revert back to old ways of thinking we're better because of whatever reason. May we remember that the pride of Phariseeism really is within all of us. And only by your grace can it be conquered. And we know that it can appear again so easily until Jesus comes. May that day be soon. In Jesus' name, amen.